dear Lord, and help us all to learn and to put away any distractions in our minds and just this, to listen intently and to um, be ready to receive what you would have us to learn. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so here we are in Genesis chapter 4. Now, like I said, we only got two weeks left tonight and next week, and we're finished with the book of Genesis. There's a lot of great stories in this book, um, but to bring you up to speed where we are in Genesis chapter 49, of course, this entire chapter is just dealing with Israel or Jacob blessing his 12 sons. The 12 tribes of Israel, he gives his blessings here. In chapter 48, last week, we saw he gave a special blessing unto the sons of Joseph, unto Ephraim and Manasseh. He blessed them. And a little bit of what I taught last week is going to spill into this week's sermon. But what we see, just a broad overview, this entire chapter basically just deals with him giving a blessing to each one of his sons individually. So let's get started here. In verse number one, the Bible says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. So these blessings, and what he's, what he's telling them now, these, and these are his last words. When you go to the end of the chapter, of course, he, he dies. He gives up the ghost. So he's basically on his deathbed here giving these blessings. And these are things, all of everything that he has mentioned here, these are all things that are going to happen in the future. These are all future events. It's not something that's like they're going to receive these blessings right away. It's, it's further down the line. And we're going to see some of these are, are prophecies going way into the future, talking about the coming of Jesus Christ from Judah. But we'll get into that. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So he says in verse 2, Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. So they all come around, all of his children. His sons come unto him. Verse number 3 starts off with Reuben because he goes in order of their birth. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defiledst thou it. He went up to my couch. Now, turn back, if you would, to... Um, Genesis chapter 29. I want, we're going to keep your place here. We're definitely going to be doing a lot from Genesis 49. I want to, I want to cover a little bit from last week because I, I brought this up real briefly. But I'm going to go into more detail tonight. In chapter 48, Ephraim and Manasseh were blessed. And, you, and remember at the end of chapter 48 how he said, He's going to give them a portion, which was basically a double portion. It was a second portion that he had gotten from, um, who was it that he slain? The, um, the Amorites. In, in the last verse of chapter 48, it says, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Now, normally, the double portion of the inheritance will go unto the firstborn son. That was just the way that they do it. It was actually part of the law, and we're going to see that in a minute. But Joseph and his sons, got they actually are the ones that received the double portion. We're going to see why that happened. We saw right here in this, at the very first part of chapter 49, Reuben, he says, look, you're my firstborn, you're my might, you're the beginning of my strength, the excellency of my power is in you, you should have been the great son, you know, the, the son to carry on the name and, and to get the double portion, my firstborn son, he says, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. So what happened is, and we're going to see that in just a minute, he went up to... Um, one of the handmaids that, that became Israel's wife and had relations with her. He lay with her the way that a husband would lay with a wife. He did that with his, with his father's concubine. Now, you're in Genesis 29. Get verse number 31 because this is all important to lay out here. Reuben was a child of Leah. He was the firstborn. Look what it says in Genesis 29:31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. 
Early on in Jacob's life, when he went to work for Laban, he fell in love with Rachel. That was a woman that he wanted to marry. So he agreed to work for seven years in order to receive Rachel. And I'm going to go through this as a brief synopsis. We went through all of this when we covered the book, of, you know, each chapter at a time. But just to lay the foundation here, he loved Rachel. He wanted to marry Rachel. He worked for seven years for Laban in order to marry Rachel. And then on the wedding night, what happened? Laban deceived him and gave her Leah. Well, Leah wasn't the one that he wanted to marry. So then Laban said, okay, okay, well, I'll give you, you'll fulfill her week, and I'll give you Rachel also, so then you could have two wives. Both of his daughters, Laban's daughters, became um, Jacob's wife. But he loved Rachel, but he ended up getting married to Leah the night that he consummated that marriage, and, and she was his first wife, and his, uh, legitimately his first wife. But we saw here that God saw that Leah was hated. He didn't want anything to do with her. But see, and that was wicked in of itself, and I'm not going to go into that because he, she was his wife. And whoever you're married to, you know, it's wicked to hate your spouse. No matter what happens, you should always love your spouse. Once you make that commitment, I mean, obviously, you, you know, most people aren't in this situation where you've just been completely duped, right? Where you're just like, like that is not the person I, I wanted to marry at all. Like the next day. <laughs> might, some people might say that years down the road, be like, you're not the person I married. But this is like the very next day. It's like, wait a minute. You're not Rachel. This is a unique situation. But regardless of that, some people will say, hey, you're not the person I married. But we shouldn't be hating our spouse. We ought to love them. That's who you're married to. That's who you made a commitment to through the good times, through the bad times, when people change, when bad things happen, whatever. You need to stick together with your spouse and love your spouse. But... Here we see that God even sees that Leah's hated. So what does he decide to do? He opens up her womb. He says, okay. And Leah's thinking, hey, great. I'm having a son. Rachel didn't provide a son for him. I'm having a son. That makes me a little bit more special. Maybe he'll love me now. And anyone who has children knows there is a bond that grows even closer between a husband and wife when you start having children. Because there's, there's a person now that is part you and part them. And, and it's hard to put into words, but when you, you know, between you and your spouse, it's something that you, only you two can share, being the, the parents of this child. Rachel could not share what, what Jacob had with Leah with Reuben being born. Just couldn't happen. So that's why Leah was thinking, great. And, this is, and that's another reason why God decided to say, okay, Leah's being hated. I'm going to open up her womb. But I, I didn't want to get too deep into this. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 21. Because in the law that was given to Moses, now look, I understand that, that this was prior to Moses and prior to that law being handed down. But it's still, I believe this is still in effect. There's a lot of things that were written down into law that I believe were, were followed prior to God giving them to Moses. And I believe this is one of them. But, but that's not even that important at this point. We're going we're to look at this, what the law says in, in Deuteronomy 21, uh, verse number 15. It's spelled out here. Deuteronomy 21, 15. If a man have two wives, which Jacob did, one beloved and another hated. Well, didn't we just see that Leah was hated and Rachel was loved, right? So this is the exact scenario that Jacob is in. Let's see what it says. And they have borne him children. Both of them, right? Both the beloved and the hated. This is what happened. Rachel had Joseph and Benjamin, and Leah had four other sons. You know, he had Reuben and Simeon and, and those other sons. He says, and if the firstborn son be hers that was hated. Okay, yeah, this is the exact scenario we're looking at. The firstborn son is Reuben. She's the son of her that was hated, Leah. So this is what God commands in the law, verse 16. Then it shall be, when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. It's no mistake that Jacob said unto Reuben, Thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength. He's recognizing that fact. He is completely aware of this. 
He knows the law, and he's recognized him as being the legitimate firstborn son. See, what God's trying to avoid here is saying, oh, well, the, one, the, the son of the, of the woman that he loved to give him a bigger portion because he loves her and he wants that son to get more. God's saying that's wicked. You can't do that. Even though you, you, know, you, you have a wife that you hated, that, that's the firstborn that gets that right. But see... Something happened with Reuben. Reuben essentially forfeited his right to the firstborn double portion. And even regardless of, of Israel's wants or, or desires here, we can't even think to, to say, oh, Israel wanted to give Joseph the double portion more than he wanted to give it to Reuben. Reuben screwed it up all on his own. And he legitimately screwed up. Look at Genesis 35. Verse number 22, we're going to see what he did. We're going to see um, it recorded in Genesis 35 what he did. Genesis 35, verse 22. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in, the, in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now, the sons of Jacob were 12. So it's not a very big mention. And it obviously doesn't go into detail, but it tells us right here that Reuben went and he lay with, his, with Bill, his father's concubine. That is wickedness. Again, when you, if, you, if we were to go into, I don't have it in my notes to go into this, but the Bible lays out not to go into the wife of your father or like your aunt, like all these people that you can't lay with because it's wickedness and it's sin and it's abominable. This is something that Reuben did. It was a very serious sin. I mean, think about that. It, it, try to put this in perspective. I mean, this is, I know no one here probably has like, like multiple moms, like a polygamous family or something. But regardless, if there were, you know, it's weird enough just to think of like a sister, you know, an aunt or something like that for, for a son to be, to be having that relation with. And that's what he did with Bilhah, who, who had already known his own father. That's what he did. Turn if you would to, I know we're turning around a lot of places, but there's not going to be too many more places after this. First Chronicles chapter 5. Because this is also going to be a good transition point. First Chronicles chapter 5. Actually provides just a little bit more detail on this and, and wh why it's okay that, or why Jacob did what he did. Even though it seems to make perfect sense anyways. But this spells it out that this is the, the specific reason, just like Jacob did in chapter 49. First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, and it explains here, because in Chronicles it goes through the genealogies, and it, you know, it usually goes through by firstborns and stuff, and, and it puts a lot of emphasis on that, because there, there has been all, um, in the Old Testament, for sure, on firstborn sons. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. So it's explaining here that just by going through the genealogy of the firstborn, that has nothing to do with the double portion of the inheritance. That's, those are two separate things. The genealogy is not reckoned based off of who gets the actual birthright. If you remember Esau and Jacob, you know, Esau sold his birth, birthright unto Jacob. Jake, Esau was the firstborn. He was the legitimate one to have received that double portion. But when he came in and he was hungry and he didn't have anything to eat, he sold that birthright unto Jacob for, for a bowl of soup, for some pottage. That's, a, that's what he sold it for. He had no vision for the future. And that was a whole other sermon that I preached on that subject. I won't re-preach that tonight. But he sold his birthright. That became Jacob's, even though Jacob wasn't the firstborn. And now we see Reuben. He was a legitimate firstborn, but he screwed that up because of his sin that he commit, that now his birthright was taken from him and given unto Joseph. Verse number two, look what it says, For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. So Joseph actually received the birthright, which is the double portion. And that worked out because it went unto his two sons. So they each got an equal portion because those two went to Joseph, which carried down unto Ephraim and Manasseh. But here, so here we see Reuben being the firstborn, Judah prevailing above his brethren because out of the, the, the descendancy of Judah came Jesus Christ. 
and Joseph was the one who actually received the birthright. But let's, let's jump ahead here. Go back to Genesis chapter 49. But one thing that we could learn from this, and we'll see this also um, looking at Simeon and Levi. We had a little bit of a discussion about this earlier before service out soul winning too, but you know, the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, this has nothing to do with the salvation, right? With your soul being saved. We know that our soul is saved by grace, through faith, that nothing can change that. God gives you a free gift. You receive it. You're saved forever. But blessings, which is what... Israel's doing here at this point, he's giving blessings. He's handing out blessings. There's a birthright that's being passed out, an extra inheritance and, and, and extra blessings being handed out. One thing that these people, that some of these people did in their life messed up everything else. It messed up their blessing. It messed up their, the, the blessing for their children. I mean, Reuben, that double portion would have been significant for his children, for his descendants after him. But because he made a mistake earlier in his life, that screwed up everything. We need to be very, very careful with the things that we do and, and giving in to temptation and sin because sometimes one major, th one major sin that you commit can have repercussions going all the way forward even into your children. And we see that happening here. We're going to see the same thing when we cover um, Simeon and Levi. They also don't receive a blessing. Because you look at Reuben, it's like, okay, you know, he's standing there. He's probably waiting for, for his father to bless him. He starts off great. He's like, yeah, you're my firstborn. You know, my, the, my strength and the excellency of, my di of dignity. Then he just says, unstable as water, thou shalt not accept. You're not going to go anywhere because you're unstable. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defiledst thou it. He went up to my couch. And that's it. No blessing for you, Reuben. Remember when you did that? Yeah, back when we read it in the Bible, it was one line. It was Genesis 35, 22. Just one line. We don't see Israel doing anything about it back then. We don't see anything happening. But you know what? When it came time to the double portion being handed out, when it came time for the serious blessing to be received, he said, oh yeah, yeah, remember, remember when you did that? Yeah, no, you're not getting the blessing. We need to be careful with God because God is capable of blessing us. God is able to give us all kinds of things in this lifetime and in the future. You know, there are crowns, there are rewards that we can earn for ourselves in heaven. We don't want to screw up the good blessings of God by giving in to the, to the pleasures of sin for a season. We, we need to, to make sure that as we go forward, now look, if you've already done bad things in your past, there's nothing you can do about that now. You cannot change the past and you shouldn't dwell on the past. What you need to do is just grieve about the past, whatever you've done, repent and get over it and then start living for God and moving forward. Because Judah was that example. Judah had all kinds of problems in his past. But Judah prevailed past them. See, Reuben, he still says he's unstable. You know, he, he did that very big sin but he's still unstable. Judah had his problems. Remember, he went in unto a, un, what, what he thought was a, was a whore. It was, it was the, his son's wife because he had two sons that he raised that were wicked that God actually killed, Ur and Onan. God killed them. L literally, God's the one that killed them. Like by the hand of God, both of his sons, were, or two of his sons died, Ur and Onan. And then the wife that was given unto Ur became Onan's wife. And then she was supposed to be given unto his other son. And he never did it. He never kept his end of the deal. And then he, you know, she was waiting and waiting and waiting. And it's like, he's not giving me his son to be married. So she dressed up like a, like a prostitute. And, you know, that whole story, he, he goes in unto her and she had children by him. And um, that was Judah. Right? That was Judah's past. That was when Judah was doing some bad things. But then we saw a different Judah when it came time to go into Egypt. And when Judah was willing to give himself in order for Benjamin to be, to be saved to go back to Israel. And he was, he was being real selfless and, and giving of himself. And that's what we see here. Look at Genesis 49 verse 8. We're going to see the blessing for Judah. 
Because Judah prevailed above his brethren. He's the one that, that, that received the right of, of um, Jesus Christ being born of his descendancy. Verse number 8, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh, until Shiloh come. And Shiloh is referring to Jesus Christ. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So he's saying here that he's going to have the lawgivers that are going to come from his seed, his descendancy. And that's where the, you know, the kings, um, like King David, was of the tribe of Judah. And they, you know, from that line forward, there was the descendancy in Judah that was given, the, uh, and from the city of Judah too, or the region of Judah, Judah's area. There was um, lawgivers from between his feet all the way until Jesus Christ came. And it says, And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Look at verse 11. Binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. So now we're getting a little bit of a description of Shiloh that is to come. It talks about him washing his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes and his eyes being red with wine and his teeth white with milk. So here we see a, a, a real small glimpse. But turn, if you would, keep this, this, this imagery in mind that he gives of Jesus Christ and turn to Revelation 19. Of course, keep your finger here. We're coming back to Genesis 49. Look at Revelation 19. Because remember, he said that um, I'm going to tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Revelation 19 is, is pretty last days in the, in the grand scheme of things. Revelation 19, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Look at this. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So here we see Jesus Christ on the, right ho on the white horse, his eyes as a flame of fire, which could be the, the, the red wine, right? It would be a similar color to flame of fire. And his clothes, his vesture, his vest, his garment that he was wearing, right, being dipped with blood. And that's what we saw here also with Judah. Um, his garments, he was washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Of course, that's referring to the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, flip back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 49. So here we see that's coming from Judah. Judah receives that honor of Jesus Christ being born of his uh, descendancy. And the blessing that he received. See, the works that we do in this life, the works that we do for God, God will give us a blessing for those things. At the judgment seat of Christ, we'll earn rewards. And the Bible says that you know, all the works that we do are going to be gathered together. And there's going to be some works that are wood, hay, and stubble, with others that are gold, silver, and precious stones. Hopefully. Hopefully you have the gold, silver, and precious stones in your life that, that are going to be there because that's all that's going to abide the fire when, when Jesus tries your works, when he tests them and says, okay, what did you really do for me? Did you just spin your wheels? Did you just, just pretend to do stuff? You know, did you just live your life for yourself? Or what did you do? What did you accomplish in your life and all the works that you've done? Well, whatever abides, whatever had eternal value, that's going to be a blessing for you. And praise the Lord, that's going to be a great blessing. That's an eternal reward. That's something you're going to have forever. But if you end up doing nothing, it's all going to be burnt up. It's all going to be lost. It's all going to be good for nothing. What we do in this life matters. And we, see, we saw that already with, with these other people. Let's look at Simeon and Levi. Let's see how that affected them. Look at verse number five. I know we're, we're kind of jumping around a little bit with the blessings but look at verse number 5. He says in Genesis 49, Simeon and Levi are brethren. 
Instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So he calls Simeon and Levi instruments of cruelty. And he's referring to one event. He's referring to that one event that happened in Genesis 34. I'll just read it for you. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. You could turn, if you would, um, to 1 Samuel chapter 11. We'll get there in a little bit. Genesis 34, when Dinah, uh, Israel's daughter, was, um, ended, up having, having, ended up fornicating with Shechem, basically what happened is Levi and Simeon went then and, and destroyed all the men in the city. I'll read the passage for you. Genesis 34, 25 says, And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore. Because what they did was Shechem wanted to marry Dinah. And what they said is, okay, you know, if you want to marry our daughter, if you want to marry our sister, here's what you have to do. You all have to be circumcised. And they were all full-grown adult males. She's so saying, you have to be circumcised so you're like us. Once your men are like, like us, then we can give our daughters unto you and we'll take your daughters unto us and we can become one people is what, is what their plan was. But they were, they were tricking him. They were deceiving him. Because Shechem was willing to do anything for her. He loved Dinah. And he, wanted to, he was willing to do this, and he talked his whole family and everybody into doing this. And that's why I said on the third day when they were sore, because after three days, then it really kicked in, and they were, they were really sore. They weren't at full health. They weren't able to defend themselves very well. It says that the two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And they slew Hamor and Shechem with his, his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. That's what Simeon and Levi ended up doing. What they did was they, they, they took matters into their own hands. They took vengeance upon Shechem. Upon Do now look, Shechem fornicating with Dinah wasn't right. But nowhere did we see, and I covered this when I preached on Genesis 34, I do not believe that Shechem raped Dinah. I do not believe that he forced her. Some people teach that. I, you could listen to Genesis 34. I do not believe that he forced her for a second. I believe that it was consensual. I believe that she went out to see the daughters of the land, and next thing you know, she's shacking up with Shechem. And that's what happened. That's what the Bible records. Nowhere do you see her being forced. Now, it was dishonorable. It was a disgrace to the family that their daughter fornicated with this guy, that she didn't get married first, that she, waited, and that she was even having relationships with this heathen man. That was not right. But what was even worse was the fact that now her brethren decided to take matters in their own hands and say, okay, well, we're going to go show him. I mean, the Bible says, vengeance belongeth unto the Lord. He will repay He's going to be the one that recompenses. He's going to make any wrongs right. We don't need to be taking up arms and going and, and executing judgment upon people. That's the very reason why people say, oh, you know, I get these comments on YouTube because I say that I believe that God's laws are perfect. I believe that God's laws are just. I believe that, that adulterers should be put to death. I believe that sodomites should be put to death. I believe that, that these laws work and I believe that, the, that God was righteous in giving out the laws that he gave in the Old Testament. And I think that we should be following these laws today. And then people will say, oh, yeah, well, you're so tough. You talk about it. Why don't you go out and do it? And people say, it's like, look, it's not my job. God's law was given to be the law of the land. It was a, it was a righteous law. And it's the laws that we should be abiding by. And if we did abide by these laws, hey, other nations would look at us with fear and be like, wow, there's a nation that fears the Lord. Hey, there's a, there's a, a nation that has wisdom. And our, our crime rates would go down. Everything would be so much better if we could just follow God's laws. 
And they're pretty simple. There's not a lot of them. But if we used the, the justice that he ordained, things would be a lot better. But God is a God of law and of justice. God is a God that, that believes in having... Um, you know, due process, basically what we call today, obviously it's not a, a biblical term, due process, but where people would be able to stand before a judge, where evidence can be submitted, where you have witnesses and people to testify of what's true and what's a lie, and people can, you know, and a judge that can determine after hearing all sides of the story of what has happened and make a judgment. That is what needs to happen. And then God said, okay, once you determine someone to be guilty of whatever the, the crime was, he gave all the punishments. He said, these are all worthy of death penalty. Stealing another person, kidnapping, that's worthy of death. Like I said, adultery is worthy of death. And I, I w would to God we had the death penalty back in place for adulterers. That's what they deserve. That's what God says. It's a serious sin. But today, people just don't think it's that big of a deal. Because everybody's doing it. It's not even against the law. It's not a big deal. I mean, what's the, what's the worst that could happen is that you could get awarded a divorce because someone committed adultery. I mean, just being unfaithful, that's it. You could get a little bit of money from them if you were dependent on, on your spouse. Like, there, there's, there's, no, there's no punishment for a crime being committed, and it is a crime. It's a serious crime. So that's what they did. Now look at what it says, though, when it describes in Genesis 49. He says, they were instruments of cruelty. They hatched this plan. And they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make them circumcise themselves. And then we're going to go in when they're weak. And we're, we're going to kill all the males. We're going to kill all the men. And they went and they spoiled them and did all that stuff. They were instruments of cruelty in their habitations. And so much where Jacob's saying, you know what? My soul... Jacob's soul, my soul, come not thou unto their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. He's basically saying like, don't have nothing to do with you guys. I'm a man of honor, you are men of dishonor. My honor is not going to be united with you. So here's two more people when Jacob's given out his, his blessings, they get nothing because of what they've done. He says, for in their anger they slew a man and in their self-will they dig down a wall. See, how did Israel deal with it? We don't know how he was going to deal with it, but he wasn't dealing with it the way that they wanted him to deal with it. So they, and, and who was the one that needed to make the decision? Israel was. He was the father. He was the one in, the, in place to make a decision on what needed to happen with Shechem and Dinah, his daughter. That was his place. In their self-will, they decided we're going to take it on ourselves and we're going to do this. They didn't care what their dad said. They didn't care what anyone says. They decided in their own self-will, they dig down the wall. They destroyed a whole city. Verse 7, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now, when you look throughout the Bible, anger is usually referred to as a negative thing. It's not a good thing to be angry, you know, but it does happen, and the thing is, well, we, we also have to understand that being angry is not always a sin. Now, they took their anger. You know, for them to be angry that Shechem laid with their sister would, would have been justified. There's nothing wrong with it being angry. But when they turn it into this fierce wrath and this cruelty and going and actually killing the entire city of men, that's taking it way too far. So you can be angry about things. The Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. There's a time and a place for getting angry. But we ought not to carry that anger over and over again. I mean, they hatched this plan. They were angry from that day until they told them to circumcise themselves. And then for even three days later, they waited. Their, the sun did not go down on their wrath, on their anger. They, they took that and, and they weren't satisfied until there was blood. But I had you turn to 1 Samuel eleven six. 6. I just want to point this out because a lot of people don't understand this, the fact that not all anger is wrong or sinful. Jesus was recorded as being angry a couple times in the Bible. He actually had anger. He looked, when, when they asked him, you know, when, when they're trying to trap Jesus and say, oh, you know, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? He looked on them in anger and he healed the guy. 
He was angry that they're trying to, you know, that they don't want this person to be healed just because it's a Sabbath day. Like, like, he's performing miracles. And this person has been afflicted for however long, you know, their whole life or whatever. And he's saying, you don't want this person to be healed because of your, your man-made laws and you, you think that that's obeying the Sabbath? You think that's what God wanted for, for this law is that a person can't be made whole, they can't be healed? And that made him angry. It also, he's also angry when the, when the money changers and the, the people are buying and selling the, the, the doves and all the other animals that they were selling in the temple of God. That made him angry. 1 Samuel 11, verse 6. Look what happens with Saul. Saul hears this news and this story. He hears about the people that, that you know, um, let me turn there real quick because they wanted to, what they wanted to do, this invading army wanted to, um, take him over and they said yeah we don't really want to fight and they said okay well here's what you need to do you need to pluck out your eye and then you can be our servants and we won't kill you and they were going to take him over and uh, Saul heard about this and, it, and well let's read a little bit more we got a little bit of time it's a shorter sermon tonight Look at, look at verse number 1 of, of chapter 11. Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us and we will serve thee. So Nahash comes up and he's, he's ready to have war against um, Jabesh Gilead. And they say, Okay, just make a covenant with us, make a deal with us, and we'll serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. So he's saying, it's going to be, you know, here's what, here's what you're going to do. Pluck out your right eyes so that it's just known that, you, you know, basically that you're so afraid of me that you're going to pluck out your own right eye and then, and then you could be my servants. And he said, it's going to be a reproach upon all Israel. Verse 3, And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then, if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. So, well, what a bunch of wimps, right? I mean, they're saying like, okay, well, wait, can you just give us a week? Let's just see if we can get some more people to help us out and to fight against you. But if we can't, then okay, we'll, we'll do what you say. Verse 4, Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. So they came... And, and they tell the, the, the people here, and, and they're all sad about it. And look at verse 5. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field, and Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. He got angry about that. He got angry for the whole situation, but why did he get angry? It says the Spirit of God came upon him. So if the Spirit of God is on him, and then you see Saul getting angry, we can know that anger is not always a sin. Right? I mean, this is a very clear verse that shows that. That God's Spirit was resting on him, and then he got angry. And God's Spirit continued with him, because that's, then he like slays a, an ox, he sends off you know, 12 parts of the 12 tribes, and he's saying, look, you need to come and help us out. We're going to fight this battle. We're going to win this battle right now. And that's when he starts, you know, really leading the people. It's his first victory as a king. And, um, you know, it goes on and on from there. But I just wanted to point that out, that the Spirit of God came upon Saul, and his anger was greatly kindled greatly. So being angry is in sin. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. So being angry isn't the sin, but being in control of your emotions and being in control of your anger, being in control of things, that is what you, where you need to be. See, Jesus was in complete control of his anger. When he saw the, the money changers and everything happen, you know what the first thing he did was? He made a whip. Now, I've never personally made a whip before. But even if he did just a pretty quick, well, actually, that's not true. I've made, I've made whips, but not like the way that, that, that I envision him making a whip. I, I, I've turned little towels or rags into whips, but that's not really the same thing. Jesus actually took the time to make a whip. Okay? And I'm sure it didn't take him a very long time, but he was in control. 
He didn't just flip out the moment he saw what was going on. Now, he did get angry, but he decided, he said, okay, make a whip. I know, he knew exactly, he had a plan, he knew exactly what he was going to do, I make a whip, go over there, and, you know, made a scene, but he was, you know, he flipping over the tables and stuff, he was making a point, and he drove them out. And he got him out of there, and he, made, and, and he was angry about it, but then, you know what, his anger was gone. And it was fine. And, and he, but did he go and, like, kill them all? No. He didn't take it to that extreme. He didn't, he didn't execute wrath upon them. He was angry, and he, and he let them know that this was important, and he used a little bit of force to do it with the whip, but he didn't go killing anybody, okay? Not like Simeon and Levi did when they were going and, um, and killed an entire city. So obviously, you know, being angry, there's a time and a place for it. But it ought not to be a major part of your life. Okay, we, and we definitely ought not to be swift to anger. It shouldn't be, you know, you should have a long fuse before you get to a point where you're really angry. We ought to be long-suffering. You know, all the great attributes of God and of Jesus Christ himself is, you know, long-suffering. It takes, it takes a long time before that anger gets kindled. There's a lot that has to happen before you get to that point. You know, if you get to that point, it's not necessarily a sin. But you need to be, and you also need to be in control. You need to show that temperance to be able to, to control your anger. You're not just flipping out. And You know, one thing with kids, sometimes the more you have, especially and when they're young, it can be easy to just kind of feel like you're losing your mind because they're all over there and they're making all these messes and stuff. But the last thing you want to do is to allow yourself to get angry and out of control. Because that's where happens, where, where honestly with, with abusive situations can happen that way, is when parents get out of control angry and that's when, instead of giving a correction that, that the Bible teaches is necessary, by giving a good spanking on their behind can, can turn into more if you have lost control. And as a parent, you need to keep yourself in check about that and be very serious about that. And if you feel like, like you are losing control because of your anger, then you need to stop a minute and you just wait on the discipline of the child until you're at a point where you are in control and you know what you're doing. But let's go back to Genesis chapter 49. We're going to close out pretty quick here. We're going to go through the rest. Of this. We'll read. We'll read the rest of these. But like, those were the the main, the main. Um, I, they weren't even all blessings, but th these are kind of the main characters in the story. In the story, anyways. Like a lot of these, when we look at Issachar and Dan and Gad, like there's not even a whole lot recorded about them in the Bible. But they each got their blessing. Each one of them got their specific, and it was all specific to the person and to what they did and to their attributes and who they were is how they received their blessing. So the, the main point that I want to take away from this is who you are will determine, determine the blessing that, that God will give you and how you decide to live, with your, live your life. So let's see, Judah, uh, verse number 13, Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for an haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Zion. So not a whole lot there, just saying the geographic region where he's going to be, he's going to be at the sea, he's going to have good commerce, probably going to be blessed with, with those riches of being at haven. Verse 14, Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good, and the land that it was pleasant, and he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. And here we see a little bit about Issachar. It kind of looks like he didn't really want to do the hard work. It said he's strong. He's capable of doing the work. He's a strong ass couching down between two burns. He's got, he's got these two burns to take care of, but then all of a sudden he sees, hey, rest is good. The land's pleasant. I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm not going to do this rest. So it says he bowed his shoulder to bear. He put his shoulder down. He, didn't, he, he, he let his, his work down and as a result of that became a servant unto tribute paying other people because he wasn't doing he wasn't willing to do the work verse 16 Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel Dan shall be a serpent by the way an adder in the path that bite at the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. That's like the shortest one here. It's kind of it's funny. He's just saying, well, people are going to come and overcome you, but at the very end, you're going to get them back. Verse 20, out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. 
And then verse 22, and I'm not going to get into this too deep because this just basically summarizes the story of Joseph. And that covers many chapters throughout uh, the book of Genesis. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by one. And this is the longest one. He gets the most, you know, blessing from Jacob. And, you know, it, it, it needs to be mentioned, he was the firstborn. So he was the favorite. He was the firstborn of the one that he loved, of Rachel. But um, he also endured quite a tremendous amount of, of hardship also. And he went through a lot of time of not having anything. And now, in the end, is receiving this blessing. So let's read here, verse 22. Jo Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. Talking about his early life, when his brethren sold him into slavery and, and, and all the bad things that happened to him. Verse 24, but his bow abode in strength. And the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. And we saw that throughout Joseph's life. He trusted in the Lord. God was with him. Even when he was in prison, the Bible says, but God was with him. God was there the whole way. Why? Because Joseph retained his integrity. Because Joseph was humble enough to, to serve the Lord. And whether, whether he was in good times or in bad times, he was serving God. And it says here that, that you know, the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, from thence is the shepherd, talking about from the God of Jacob, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, even by the God of thy father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under blessings of the breasts and of the womb. And here we see the blessings of the, of the breasts and of the womb is having many children. And that's what we see through Ephraim and Manasseh is this specific blessing of just being multiplied. Remember the, 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 the blessing that was on Abraham and then on Isaac and then on Jacob. Jacob in chapter 48 passed it on to Ephraim and Manasseh and that blessing was the seed being multiplied as the sand which is by the sea and all that. Well, that blessing was being passed even though you know, there's, the, there's a reference to Jesus Christ in that, but then also just the physical descendancies. And that comes through, through Ephraim and Manasseh were blessed. Uh, when you look at the, the history and f through Chronicles and you see the numbers that were counted, Ephraim and Manasseh have, have a huge amount of people that were born and, and God had blessed them with that multiplication there. Uh, verse 26, The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. <clears throat> they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. So he's saying his blessings that Israel has received even in his lifetime has is, is way outgrown what his, what his father's blessings were, what Abraham and Isaac had. He said that his blessings have gone out and that those blessings now are on the head of Joseph. And he's kind of passed that down unto him, which should have gone to Reuben, but no, it goes unto Joseph. Reuben screwed it up. Verse 27, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf in the morning. He shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is it that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. Each one individually, they received their own blessing. Verse 29, And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. So now he's giving him his final wishes on where he needs to be buried. He's saying, this is where I want to be buried. And look at what he says in verse 31. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. Now it's interesting when he comes around near the end of his life how we can see that Leah has earned a spot in his heart. She wasn't always the hated one. She was early on. But when it came down to where he was going to be buried and where he was going to lay his head, you know, Abraham and Sarah, they were buried there. Isaac and Rebekah, they were buried in this cave. And now him and Leah, which was his, his first wife and the one that deserved the honor and the respect, 
he, he did right, and you know, who knows how his relationship changed over the years, but he did end up loving her. It's apparent here that, that he's giving her that honor of being buried in the same place with him um, at the end of his life. So it's kind of nice to see that because you, know, you, you feel bad for Leah. She, was in, she wasn't in the best situation. I mean, she was probably told to, to, to be partake in that whole uh, scenario where Laban was deceiving him. And then there she is, and she's married to someone that hates her. And that's, you know, and all throughout the, the, the Bible, we're seeing her trying, you know, she has these children. She's like, now maybe he's going to let me, now, you know, now, now maybe he's going to, you know, she's always vying for his affection and always trying to, to win that. But um, here we see finally, at least in his last wishes, that, that's where he's going to be buried next to her. Verse 32, the purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was of the from the children of Heth. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed. So he was sitting up on his bed. He goes back. He lays down. It says, and yielded up the ghost, and he was gathered unto his people. So there we see him die. And then we got one chapter left next week, chapter 50. Be sure not to miss that, but let's close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible here. We thank you for um, all that we can learn from these various stories, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to be vigilant about um, doing good works and, and um, obeying the laws, dear Lord, and not giving in to, to lustful desires that um, we know that we're going to reap what we sow. If we reap good things, dear Lord, we know we're going to, or if we sow good things, we're going to reap good things. But if we sow sin and wickedness, we're going, to reap, we're going to reap the same as well, dear Lord. That we're going to, it's not going to be good. I pray that you would please help us to learn from the examples of, um, of Reuben and Simeon and Levi, dear Lord, that we wouldn't do things that would be um, something that we're going to have to deal with for the rest of our life, but that we could continue to have a life that was, that's more outlined like the life of Joseph, dear Lord, where he, um, in good times and in bad, he was always uh, had integrity in serving you, dear Lord. Help us to be mindful of your words and that you'd just uh, be with us uh, every day of our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.